welcome back, Shalloners. Well, I'm sitting around watching Life of Kylie and keeping up with the Kardashians, which is something I always do when I'm getting ready for an event or a party here in New York City because it ensures that I put on the appropriate amount of makeup. Like I watch them and I'm like, I probably should add three more layers of foundation, seven more layers of contour. Why not? Then I leave the house looking like a drag queen in natural sunlight. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I was watching and it really caught my attention how Kylie in one of her episodes was like, Kendall and I would not be friends if we weren't sisters. And I know you guys have been commenting lately that you want a video on Bella and Gigi and like Kylie and Kendall, namely how Bella and Kylie were kind of like the forgotten kids of their household. Like they were not mom's favorite and how it impacted their self-esteem. And more importantly, what we can do and what we can learn if we're going through the same situation IRL in our own lives. But first, just want to remind you guys, if you want to talk with me one-on-one -on -one, privately, find me on the Instant Go app. My username is ShallonXO and click chat to get connected. And follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO where I let you guys weigh in on the latest videos. And listen to my new podcast, Girl on Top, out every Wednesday. And I answer the best questions you guys submit to me over the course of the week. So Kylie and Bella, huge similarities there. Like they both have these very glamorous older sisters. They both have very glamorous parents and families who prioritize that glamour, right? But I know for a lot of us, like, okay, I don't come from like a modeling family. I don't come from a celebrity family. Maybe you come from an intellectual family and you're not going to be a software engineer. Maybe, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you come from a very blue collar family and you are kind of like the egghead and they're looking at you like you're the freak and you feel like it's just, no matter what, if it resonates with you that like you're kind of the black sheep for whatever reason, this video is for you. So first I wanna break down Kylie and Bella. So Kylie, mm. we've done videos on her before and her like crippling lack of self-esteem. And like I said, I really hope she's like coming into her own. I think motherhood has like done wonders for that. Hopefully motherhood really can help your self-esteem. Like it not, you don't go have a baby to save yourself. Don't do that. But when you do have a baby, you realize literally what you're capable of, what your body is capable of, what your sleep schedule is capable of. Like you really kind of come into your own and level up. Um, I mean, at least I've heard I don't have a baby. I don't even have a dog, but I have had a dog. And that's how I felt about myself when I had a dog. Very proud. So Kylie has a lot of self-esteem issues. We know this based, speaking of babies, can you hear this outside my door? Don't you love it when kids cry? It's like, oh, do you have problems? I want to know what they are. Oh, you didn't like today's episode of The Wiggles? Fuck you. Anyway, back to Kylie. Back to Kylie. We can do this. We can work through this. This is, this is parenthood. Okay. I am losing my train of thought. God, I hate kids. Uh, sometimes like just fill my vagina up with cement so I can't have them. Like just leave me alone. Kylie, we know that she has issues with her self-esteem because of all the plastic surgery she's had, right? Like at such a young age. So instead of developing that core of self-love and strength, I mean like, I don't care if one guy said I had small lips. That doesn't mean I should go out and like inflate them to monster proportions. I need to learn that he's maybe a douchebag and there is nothing wrong with the way God made me, you know? But she didn't get the opportunity to develop that because she didn't have a family who necessarily encouraged that. Kylie said before that she feels like Chloe was more of her mom than Chris because, I mean, Chris has about five kids, six, I don't even know, a lot. And so by the time Kylie came along, she was... Chris was like knee deep with like Kim and like the older girls. And Kylie was kind of left to fend for herself. And then of course, having Kendall is this like gorgeous, beautiful creature of an older sister was probably further isolating. And let's not forget the confusing situation that was Bruce slash Caitlin. I mean, very difficult to have a strong male role model or even forget male or female to have a strong parental role model if you have a parent who doesn't know what they are, who's struggling with their identity. So how are they going to impart a sense of self to you when they can't even accomplish it? We know psychologically that the number one predictor of a girl's, a little girl's body image is how her mother feels about her own body. So like if we see our mom being like, I'm so fat, I'm so fat, we're gonna model that same behavior. And I mean, looking at my family, I've seen it, like I've seen it you know? 
So Chloe kind of swooped in and according to Kylie, was like more of her mother finger. Chloe's a fucking mess. I mean, look at the amount of surgery she's had. Look at the amount of self-loathing she has to the point that she gets in relationships with guys who are taken. She goes after these relationships that are clearly dead ends. She's manipulated her body to try to feel better and feel like she fits in. All she can talk about is her ugly duckling narrative. And so she definitely felt like the odd man out. And I think her and Kylie sort of identified that in, in one another. And it's just, it's sad that they kind of created this snake eating its own tail situation where it's like one of them needed to stand up and be the hero and be like, we are both fine the way we are. We don't need a bigger butt, bigger lips, bigger tits, longer nails, longer hair. We don't need any of that. We're fine. We don't look like our sisters, but we look like ourselves. And who we are is wonderfully and fearfully made. We have a personality that nobody else has. Like that didn't get to happen. And so that really plays into self-esteem. Same with Bella and Gigi. Yolanda Foster is crazy as a sack of weasels. She is a lunatic. Do you know why I know this? I'll bring it up again. I worked in celebrity journalism for 10 years. And I mean, gosh, more than that, like since I got to New York, long time, long time. So I would hear all the back end stories about Yolanda and how nuts she was. And I am proud to say I am the original Bella, I'm sorry, Yolanda Hadid Lyme disease truther. I mentioned this in another video. I'll bring it up again. I'll bring it up for the rest of my life. She claimed, I think it was in like 2014, right? She says she got Lyme disease. She also says Anwar and Bella has it, right? I, Detective Blondie, went to the CDC and I got the records for Lyme disease infection in California that year. California is over 32 million people, right? The amount of Lyme disease infection cases in the state of Connecticut that year, Connecticut's a little bitty, it's itty bitty, itty bitty was 1,400, 1,400 in Connecticut that year. In California, 32 plus million people, it was 120 infections, 120. So Yolanda, you're telling me that three of those cases happen in the same family? It's a statistical impossibility. It's impossible. Unless you pass the tick around, knowing it was the Lyme disease tick, or you just like generally sharing ticks, also, I'm from California. There aren't a lot of ticks. I've never seen one. Like, okay. It's a statistical impossibility, which means someone's lying. I don't think it's Anwar and I don't think it's Bella. They're ch they were children. You know, like they didn't have a reason. They didn't have this pathology to create and conflate something for attention. Or I think one of them did have it. And Yolanda's like, me too. I need attention also. I'm not saying she doesn't have something, but she doesn't have Lyme disease. She only got one opinion and it was from like some kind of quack doctor. She never got a second opinion. Lyme disease is very, very hard to diagnose. It's tricky. And you need like a bunch of doctors weighing in on this. Like, so the fact, and I bring this up because that informs her attitude towards her children. When mama ain't happy, when mama's sick, everyone's sick, right? She has infected her children with something. I don't know. And I think it's also significant that kind of around this time, didn't Bella get a DUI when she was like 17 or 18? That's just as Gigi's career was kind of starting to hit. That was not a coincidence to me. That was Bella crying out for attention. Positive or negative, she needed to reorient on herself. Her mom was focused on her marriage to that ego monster, David Foster. How he has convinced so many women to marry him. Oh, money. So she needed like the attention. And she got it, you know, it's, it was negative attention, but when you need attention in a family, you kind of don't care. That's what a tantrum is, right? And then when that kind of waned out, she's like, I know, I too am gonna fix my face. I'm gonna go through all these surgeries. It's working for Kylie, you know? I'm going to change myself so I see if I could change the inside. And like, especially when you have a beautiful older sister like Gigi who is all natural, like same with Kendall and Kylie. Kendall's all natural. I mean, she was, now she's had her lips done. She just looks so much heavier and older. She's so beautiful, whatever. But like when you have these older sisters who were always kind of the golden children and like just effortless in that category and people just love them and everything came so easily to them and you feel like this ugly duckling, this forgotten creature. And again, a good parent would be like, here's what you're good at. Here's why people love you. Here's how you have worth. 
and it has nothing to do with how you look, and it certainly doesn't have anything to do with how your sister looks. That would have taken them really far, but they got a lot of surgeries, and on paper, it's arguably taken them further. I mean, you could say Kylie is more popular than Kendall, and Belle is more beautiful than Gigi. Okay. But on the inside, there's still that person. There's still that person. So I know this is resonating with a lot of you guys, right? Because I get a lot of questions about like, I don't get along with my sister. When I do videos on like narcissistic people, toxic people, victim mentality, so many of you guys were like, that's my sister. That's my sister. And even if it's not, even if you guys just don't jive that well, or you are super jealous of her, you really have to go back and be like, what is it that I do? And not even that she doesn't. It's not a competition. Comparison is the root of all unhappiness. It truly is. So you need to learn how to feel good about yourself without it being, I have this and she doesn't. Because that's, even if you win that battle, you're going to lose the war. Because eventually you're going to come up against someone who is going to beat you in that category. And I used to do that. I live like kind of a flashy life here in New York City. I go to a lot of events, a lot of celebrity events. And like when I say I'm at a party and like there's prettier girls, I mean the girls are Emily Ratajkowski. Okay? Not like some bitch from Cheer Squad, like literally, objectively, really beautiful girls. And for a while, I got through it by being, I mean, first I tried to compete. Like, oh, cool, I'll, I'll starve myself also. This, I can just starve myself into better self-esteem. Kylie, you can't inject yourself into better self-esteem. I wish it worked. I really wish it did, but it doesn't. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be that the loudest person in the room. Because remember, confidence is quiet. We said that in another video. I'm going to lead with all my accomplishments. Oh yeah, you're Emily Ratajkowski. Well, I've written two books and I'm a YouTuber and I'm an editor of a magazine. I have a great education. Uh, uh, uh. And then what happens when I meet someone who wrote three books and they went to Princeton and uh, they're the editor of a bigger magazine. It's like, oh fuck, you're back to square one. So what was helpful for me when one of my friends, she's literally like, there's enough seats at the table for everyone. I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, you can be beautiful and she can be beautiful. She can be smart and you can be smart. She can be accomplished, you can be accomplished. It's not like there's one, cha- this isn't musical chairs where it's like, well, only one of us gets to be like this. And that, it was such a simple thing to say and it was so obvious, but I, it really, really helped me because I'm like, yeah, there's room enough for all of us. Who are we actually competing against? Well. If you're in a family, you know you're competing against your sister. Or sometimes you're competing against your mom for your dad's love or your dad for your mom's love. There's so many dynamics within a family. And sometimes you cannot change it. And I know you guys want videos on family, like how to put up boundaries with toxic family and how to deal with it. And I'm working on it. I'm reading a lot about it because I don't want to give advice on that subject lightly because, it, I mean, you know, hello, I'm not just some jerk who's like, Bleh. So I really put a lot of like effort and thought into things before I do it. So we'll start here. If you feel like the black sheep of your family, and not to say that your family's toxic, if you're just like one of these things is not like the other ones, you know, it can be really, really hard to maintain that familial connection, to feel like you belong, and to not sort of lapse into this loner and victim mentality. And to a degree, I really think like us millennials, we have... We're so different than boomers. I mean, they've (laughs) ruined the economy. They've ruined the environment. We're a lot more socially conscious. We're not racist and homophobic. It's the list is almost endless. But we're also very flashy, you know, like social media, selfies, posting, hashtag. We all have our own brand, blah, blah, blah. And it's very difficult for them to get their mind around that. Like (laughs) my mom joined Facebook (laughs) like years ago and like my friends would start to request her. And she's like, why is Tommy requesting me? I'm like, the social networks, the whole point. She's like, well, it feels aggressive. I'm like, mom, you know, it's like, there's just so much that they're not up on. And that's how generational gaps go. So I'm sure when we have kids, we're going to be like, what are you doing? So for me, I've always sort of understood that I was a bit like outside because I wanted, I always wanted a really flashy life. Like I grew up in a beautiful beach town in the suburbs, but it's like, I need to be in New York city. I need to be where the action is. I need to be a star. I need to be famous. I got to be just doing the most at all times. And my family's really low key. So they could not understand it. And so I realized that like, 
I can't expect all of my validation to come from them. Also, I have a really small family. If you guys saw that my grandmother passed away recently, I cannot thank you enough for how supportive everyone was. Like it, it honestly made all the difference and it really, it like got me through it. But when I was talking about it and posting about it, like I said, my bags don't look good like that, sorry. That like, I had a really small family. Like we lived like the golden girls. It was my grandmother, my great grandmother, my mom and me. So I was always very used to the idea that friends are going to be my family, you know? And I think for people like Kylie and Bella, like that, they didn't necessarily get that. Like if you have siblings and you feel out of place with your siblings, it can feel overwhelming because only children understand that like, well, of course you're probably not gonna have all of your needs met in your family. You're gonna need to import people. You gotta go out and make your family, go out and meet your family. But if you come from a, like a larger family than I did, it's, it's kind of like hard to get that memo. But what I realized is that if you don't fit in with the family, if you don't fit in with their vibe, that just means you do fit in somewhere else. Whatever you are, whatever you're into, whatever your vibe is, there are there is a tribe for you out there. You can find your people, but you have to actually look for them. You know, you can't solipsize into this victim mentality and I'm such a loner and no one understands me. Girl, ain't nothing new under the sun. Don't tell yourself to your own detriment, your own peril, that like, I'm just so unique and nobody understands me. Okay, hot topic. We're fine. So I realized as all only children do that like, yeah, I have to go import my family. I'm going to need to get these needs met from outside. And that is something that I really think people from larger families can learn from. And it's made me a better friend. It's made me actually a better daughter because I don't look at my mom and my family and be like, love every part of me. I mean, of course, like, yes, of course I need that. But it's like, it's okay if maybe my mom can't identify why I want to share all my business on YouTube and on social media. Like she doesn't get it, but that's okay. Cause I have five other friends who do. And it's hard to get over that hump because there's an element when you feel like you don't fit in with your family, there's an element of unfairness and girl, it is unfair. I get it. I get it because you always look at these allegedly happy families and you're like, if I was part of this family, I wouldn't have this problem. If I was part of this crew, they would love me for who I am. I mean, they might love that aspect of you, but they might not identify with the other 80%. This is maybe only 20% that you're not getting from your family. And you look at another crowd and you're like, they would, they would love that 20%. So therefore it's probably a hundred percent. No, it's called the 80, 20 rule. Tyler Perry talked about it in a movie and it's really impacted my life. By the way, have you guys tried this bubbly, bubbly? It's replaced La Croix in my life and my heart and my fridge. It's really good. Get it at Target. Not an ad, I just like it. So don't tell yourself that like, number one, you're doomed to walk the earth alone because you don't completely fit in with your family. Go out and find people who you do vibe with because then you can go to your family and you can just be the daughter. You can just be the sister and you can focus on the ways you do connect. You can focus on the way that Venn diagram does intersect and there won't be that bitterness. There won't be that hostility. You know, there won't be this feeling of fuck you, you wronged me. And I know a lot of times you do have that feeling and it's not incorrect. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When parents and children don't get along, it is the parents fault. It is. You trace it back. It's the parents fault. Children are hardwired to love our parents. It's a survival instinct. You ever see a baby animal who's like, fuck you, mom. Fuck you, elephant mom. I'm striking out on my own. No, we just love it. We love our parents. We see a lot of parents who don't exactly love their kids and it's heartbreaking. So I'm going to work on a series on this and how to deal with like family tensions and stuff like that, because I know it's not easy. And again, I don't want to get into this lightly and I need to do some research because I have been lucky enough to have a good relationship with my family my father though. Oh, so this is like another piece of the puzzle or things making sense. So if there's specific things you want to know about family dynamics, let me know. And I can like look into it and really do like a deep dive in a series. But for now, yes, realize the limitations of your family. And like, maybe you guys are just different people and that's okay. Don't try to artificially create the solution with plastic surgery, with going into a job that you don't like just because your parents approve with marrying or dating someone you're not into because it's part of your religion, part of your culture, whatever. You have the divine animal right, nay, the obligation 
to follow your path, not your parents' path, not your sister's path, not your cousin's path, your path. And sometimes paths are lonely, but they lead to where you need to be. And being on your path isn't about finding someone to walk on it with you in your family. Like you don't need that plus one. You got to strike out on your own and you will find the people you're meant to along the way, but not if you're not on the right path. It might be lonely at first. It might be scary. It might feel like you're disappointing everyone, but all you have to do in this life is be happy. All you got to do is stay white and die or whatever color of your chin. So start to do that. Start to focus on yourself and your own needs. Go out and find the people who align with them and then turn towards the family and be like, I accept you for who you are. If you don't accept me completely for who I am, that's okay because I have people in my life who do. It's not a perfect solution, but it really will help and will start to get you, like I said, down the path. If you guys want to talk more about this or any little thing, find me on the Instant Go app. My username is ShallonXO and get connected. And then follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO and be sure to listen to my podcast, Girl on Top, out every Wednesday. Bye.